welcome to at another episode of uh, our academy of bronchoscopy monthly webinars this month we have um, a special topic i think it's uh, a very new to everyone um, and to present this topic we have a very prominent intervention pulmonologist from the united states uh, abdul hamid al uh, we call him ab most of the times and uh, I think this is second time uh, we are inviting him to our webinar and uh, he will be speaking to us on this uh, very new topic of uh, I not uh, the real time uh, ultrasound that is uh, currently available and uh, as you know nowadays a lot of uh, interest in peripheral pulmonary nodule diagnostics um, so he'll be talking on what is his experience initial experience so we will take this webinar more like a technology corner what we do um, every three months and he will guide us on how the equipment um, works and uh, what is its real-time utility and his experience on a few cases combined with, I think, uh, probably robotic bronchoscopy. But uh, Avi, I would like to tell you, like, this part of the country, we don't have the robotic bronchoscopy yet. So most of the times, we uh, our tool of choice in peripheral pulmonary nodules is mostly radiolibus and uh, fluoroscopy guidance. But uh, now we started to develop some phone beam CT rooms in some of the hospitals in India. So with this, uh, I would like to introduce a few uh, things on peripheral pulmonary nodules and then you can later take on. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. So before we start uh, uh, from Ashoda Hospitals and Academy of Bronchoscopy, we wish all of you a uh, very happy uh, Christmas and uh, New Year 2024. So um, a lot of people are getting diagnosed with uh, lung cancer worldwide and we know it's the cancer that is more um, very dangerous, having a lot of mortality, uh, more than the three next common cancers that are uh, currently um, diagnosed. And uh, there is also a stage shift in detection, like many smaller peripheral pulmonary nodules. And then uh, all these days, our problems are like we have small GGOs like this, and most of the tools were not able to reach the diagnostic yield that the CT guided bi biopsies were able to give us. Like uh, it was considered as a gold standard, but what's happening in the current days uh, is like we have a lot of tools that have come up to increase the diagnosis of peripheral pulmonary nodules. And the previous concept mainly based on the tumor and the bronchus relation. So we always thought that uh, when we have a clear signal on the radial epus, uh, our diagnostic yields are high when you have a positive CT bronchus sign. And uh, our diagnostic yield remained very low when you don't have this uh, sign. But this was most of the data what we see on this uh, was in those days where there was no cryoprobes, I think. It was more of forceps biopsies. That is the reason why if you see the diagnostic yield of traditional bronchoscopy, we're not talking only on the imaging part, but also on the tools. Like uh, there's a lot of advancements that are happening so if you see our center, most of the times nowadays we use uh, cryoprobes even for eccentric pulmonary nodules. So that started to increase our diagnostic yield. So every lecture shows this uh, meta-analysis and shows that we are stuck up at 70. But I think things have changed and uh, now we are reaching up to 90 to 95 percent with the advent of robotic bronchoscopy, cryoprobes and uh, image guidance like phone beam. And new addition to that, we have this uh, real-time ultrasound guidance. And... Uh, also, thin uh, bronchoscopies also play a very important role, especially when we don't have um, navigation tools, um, in, especially in Asia. So it is clearly shown that when you combine forceps bi biopsy with the cryoprobes uh, and ultra-thin bronchoscopies, the diagnostic yield is around 75 percentage. And we also had a new understanding with this uh, paper from Michael Pritchett and Krish Badra that uh, uh, why our radial EBA sometimes shows a real signal but uh, we don't have diagnosis on the biopsy specimens because we have so many false imaging because of atelectasis in the periphery. So this is one thing that is added up to the literature on peripheral pulmonary nodules in the last five to six years. So, so I'll just present a small case of how we uh, routinely do our bronchoscopic practices for peripheral pulmonary nodules. And AB will show us what is addition to that, what addition uh, we can do. Like if you see, this is a patient who is... Uh, HIV positive and then he was referred to us with a small nodule in the periphery. Uh, not so periphery, but middle one third, I say around two centimeters lesion. So traditionally what we do is we go with our uh, conventional radial ebus and then try to get a signal on the radial ebus. Now you see 
uh, a clear um, eccentric image, but sometimes with uh, adjustment or after the initial puncture, you can turn uh, some of the eccentric images into concentric images also. So, but uh, this is not always uh, true because the moment we go with uh, a biopsy tool, most of the times when we use a guide sheet, we just use the guide sheet as the marker. But after the thin uh, scopes we started to use, we don't uh, use um, these guide sheets anymore. So we just rely on fluoroscopy and currently we installed our cone beam uh, CT scans. So this is one way of confirming whether you are inside the lesion or not. So you can see my cryoprobe uh, inside the lesion. Uh, but with a conventional uh, method, uh, if you don't have a cone beam or a lung, uh, lung vision, you will not be able to see the tool in lesion. So that is where I think this uh, real-time ultrasound needle guidance will play a very important role in diagnosis of peripheral pulmonary nodules. Uh, with that, uh, I invite uh, Dr. A.B. Uh, to give his insights in this uh, new technology. And uh, welcome, A.B. Uh, he is uh, currently the direct medical director at Advocate Lutheran uh, with uh, expertise in intervention pulmonology. And uh, he's been uh, instrumental in developing many new uh, technologies at his hospital. And uh, he uses a robotic bronchoscopy most of the times. So we welcome you, A.B., and then you can uh, just start your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, this is a, a great introduction. Actually, uh, you, you uh, brought uh, the speed uh, up to the points that we need to cover with this talk. Uh, I want to make sure everybody hear me well first. Uh, do you hear me uh, good there? Yes, yes. Excellent. Just making sure. And uh, the second thing, thank you for the invitation again. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to be with you, Harry, on this uh, very uh, productive and knowledgeable uh, uh, webinar series that you have. Uh, really, you are uh, keeping the speed up at uh, India for every technology and therapeutic options going on uh, worldwide. And uh, also, I wish everybody happy holidays and happy new year. Uh, so uh, as uh, Harry mentioned, we are going to talk mainly about how we are implementing the INOD, which is the ultrasound live guided tDNA. Uh, and what is the INOD? Uh, technology is and what does the needle look like and also the role of uh, INOD in advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy not only robotic bronchoscopy because I think there is a big advantage of using that uh, uh, term of uh, uh, as you mentioned not everyone has the uh, robotic everything together as uh, some centers have it some not so uh, INOT can be a great ad for that, those specific cases, especially the one you mentioned with eccentric uh, uh, lesions. And also, uh, uh, we will show an example also of life biopsy and uh, uh, we'll go over some cases. So with the new era, as you mentioned, we are dealing with uh, now uh, different technologies that allow us now to go farther in the lung and with the lung screening and the slide you placed about uh, uh, incidence of lung cancer in general uh, in, in worldwide, uh, it's high. We, we need now with the lung screening, we are seeing now lung nodules that they are very small and they are peripheral. And uh, we have the tools now to reach that far out. And uh, when we reach out, as you mentioned, we can, have, we can use the augmented uh, fluoroscopy as you see but add to add any navigation system that we use. Overlapping those technologies together allow us always to see something like this, overlap the lesions, avoid the pneumothorax, by know the borders, where's the, where's the uh, uh, pleura is, but also to be very close to the lesion that allow us to biopsy it. And we reach there and we see something like this, a centric nodule, it's like one centimeter, as you see, uh, in size, or nine millimeter. And uh, we need now to see how we can get an accurate biopsy. And with the advantage of having those technologies now, uh, we can promise the patients that 
we are not waiting for the nodules to grow. Actually, we can go after a smaller lesions. We can go after ground glass opacities, as, as you mentioned in earlier uh, in your presentation, which is something that I believe it's a very important that the jump and advancement of early detection of lung cancer will help us prevent latest changes, uh, stages of it. And that will help saving the patients from further procedures. So having now the chrome beam, as you mentioned, that allow us to have all those images during the procedure is a great advantage. And for flow for cases that we use the inode in, we used to navigate, spin, confirm we are there, and then do biopsy. But with the recent experience with us to, sh to shorten the time of the procedure, we switch. We start with the spin always. And because the same can be with the ability that you can augment the lesion on the fluoroscopy from beginning and also build up a, a track for the navigation on that augmented uh, fluoroscopy, we change our uh, approach. We start with a spin and then we navigate and then we confirm and we the biopsy. So uh, before we do that, just always, if we don't do the basics, as you mentioned earlier, we will not agree, we will not reach the nodule. So we came up with this algorithm that includes A, B, C, D. A is anesthesia, as you mentioned uh, in your slide earlier, is if we don't have a clear hyperinflated or good inflated lungs, we will not be able to approach the lung that we'll have a telactasis. Even with the best ultrasound we have, we will have a mixed pictures of, of ultrasound image. So that's why even with the use of the inod, we emphasize with, with the anesthesia about having a peep of 10 or the FIO2 to reduce absorption uh, uh, of uh, absorbing um, atelectasis. Uh, we use TIVA, avoid inhalation agent. We do a good recruitment in the beginning, fast intubation, and paralyze paralytic the patient during the procedure. Then we move to the B, the bed height, because if we don't start with a good height from the beginning, then you are delayed until you adjust your uh, uh, comb beam around it. So three feet usually is a good height for the patient bed to be there. And C, of course, centralization and clearance for the comb beam uh, before we start. And then we spin. And when we spin now, we know that we are looking for the lesion that we are targeting. And when we get there, for example, in this case, when the lesion is next to the pericardium in the right middle lobe, in multiple, as you see, uh, it's far down in the, in the also lower part of the lung, but anterior and pericardial. Uh, so with the spin, we segment uh, as, as you do there too, uh, segment the lesion. After segmenting the lesion, we confirm it in multiple, uh, uh, all the axial, coronal, and uh, sagittal. And then we use the advantage of building our own uh, airway. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, with the bronchus sign, it's very important. But now we are not having the privilege only to see that closest bronchus going to the lesion. We can plan the whole track from the trachea up to the nodule with this uh, placement of uh, markers that allow us to know in 3D and this markers will be augmented on the fluoroscopy too. So when we drive, even with the diversion that we see in the lower lobes usually, uh, uh, even with the robotic bronchoscopy best planning, you will have that diversion that can be avoided by using this free case uh, uh, airway marking. And with this airway marking done, now we can review the airway, make sure that we have it in the right direction, and we see confirm our approach uh, laterally and AP, as you see, because that will help us know when we are doing the fluoroscopy, which angle can we get applied. And removing the anatomy 
uh, uh, borders and leave only the lesion and then augment it on the fluoroscopy. And as you see here, the driving onto the lesion can be not only guided by the uh, navigation from robotic or any navigation system, but also guided by the life fluoroscopy. And with the lower lobes, always you will have that 10 to 20 millimeter diversion that he, Dr. Prashit mentioned in multiple papers, uh, especially not only because of the, the breathing, but also the position of the CAT scan when done. So reaching that far in the lungs now with a smaller, either ultra thin uh, uh, scope or uh, the bron robotic bronchoscopy that has smaller uh, diameter, you start seeing now the lesions that far. And then when you are taking the turns, sometimes you don't have to follow the navigation when you reach that far because you have the fluoroscopy augmented and that can be guiding you for the best airway that would reach. You can see now here reaching on the lower lobe and you can see now you are, even if I put the uh, radial there, I don't know if I get centric or concentric. And docking this, uh, that uh, robot, as you mentioned, and then putting the radial. And when we change the angle, you can see the radial going in different airways, but we can adjust. And now we're getting this picture again, which is eccentric. And it's dangerous even in this situation because if you're trying to biopsy uh, something like this and you know the lesion is next to the pericardium, that can be having some, uh, not only non-diagnostic, some risk of injuring the pericardium. And from the location of the radial evos there, it's very clear that my needle is going to go straight where the center of the, uh, the radial probe is. And my lesion is more toward the periphery. And with adjustment, even we try to adjust always and get to the spot that we want and adjust the radial, but still we want to get to the level where we are perhaps seeing the lesion with less uh, side effect with higher diagnostic. So here were the INOD implementation in our practice. We don't have data yet uh, uh, that support uh, the best outcome and when to use it. Uh, and uh, diagnostic yield using uh, navigation bronchoscopy, ultra thin bronchoscopy, a cone beam with no cone beam. We don't have any of that data. But what we know from our practice is that, as you mentioned earlier, using the real time imaging raised the bar for the accuracy of getting the diagnosis for sure. And we jump up to the 95% because we know exactly where the lesion is and we might can make adjustment. Now reaching the, the level of the lesion, even seeing it, when we're doing biopsy, we are not 100% we're biopsying the center of the lesion. Uh, also, medial lesions usually, which is in the inner third of the lung, you will have some kind of neighboring blood vessels for sure, because that's where the, the PA is branching and that one, usually you have a good ultrasound image, but unfortunately you might have a blood vessel that is there too. And uh, the last one is uh, bronchus sign is a good sign when it is in the lesion, but when we have those nodules and the bronchus sign not inside the lesion or next to it, that the time we keep in our consideration that we might need to use the INOD in those cases. And uh, I will start just because not everybody, I think, know exactly what the needle looks like and how it's connected. You can see this is a system that comes with different pieces, but it's a stand with a screen that gives you the ultrasound image with a processor that is this part of the portable or can be hanged uh, for the part of the needle. So the needle itself is having the same concept like any other tBNA, although it has some reversed uh, 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 locations for the uh, uh, understanding. Uh, and, and for example, uh, here's the needle lock, uh, which is a press, uh, you press against it 
to release uh, the lock and then you can advance the needle in this direction. And the depth of the needle, uh, the stylet is up here. You have also normal saline flush because if you don't have a clear picture from the beginning, uh, because you have, especially if the airway larger than the uh, probe size, uh, uh, then you don't have a good, good uh, uh, like a, a media around the probe to give you a good ultrasound image. In that case, you can inject a CC of normal saline that goes exactly next to the uh, probe and fill that space of air to give you a good image. <clears throat> The next uh, part is the needle depth. As you see, it's reversed from what we have in the uh, EBUS, which is lower here, it's up here, but that gives you the understanding how far you are pushing the needle in. <clears throat> the needle itself, uh, it uh, goes uh, the part of the probe, which is straight, and the needle come as almost with the same concept as EBUS scopes with the needle coming out. So the needle usually come in that uh, angle, which is like 15 to 20 degrees. Um, and the ultrasound probe is the one that will be in the straight uh, manner of the uh, total probe and needle sheath. Uh, the ultrasound probe stays inside that sheath protected and the needle can be in and out uh, when you perform the TBNA. The needle shape, uh, it's a 25 gauge. It has that uh, shark uh, core uh, Boston scientific needle uh, that the goal from it to get almost a core biopsies, but uh, the size also uh, limiting uh, for getting a big sample, but also it is uh, less traumatic and that the sheath that allow you the size of the needle to be there. Uh, going to the point that if we are not fusing robotic bronchoscopy, it goes with ultra thin and also has a good uh, flexibility. I never faced a situation where it adjusts my uh, uh, bronchoscopy uh, to be away from the, uh, the lesion when we are advancing through the scope, even with uh, acute turns. And when we put on the, uh, get the image, you have not only the ultrasound, usual ultrasound echo. You can see that you have this dark, triangle that is a sheath that covering part of the uh, uh, probe getting letting you know the contra le, uh, contra side where the needle is coming out so that indicator uh, can be either seeing this dark uh, triangle hyperechoic uh, triangle or seeing that hyperechoic uh, a marker down here. In some cases, it's very hard to see that hypochoic uh, mark marker, but always you have this background uh, hyperechoic mark that you know your needs is gonna come out with the angle that we mentioned far from the center of the signal to this area. And the needle itself uh, carried by the operator, uh, as I mentioned, is connected with one wire that goes to the processor. The processor either carried by an assistant or can be also mounted on the same uh, uh, screen. The screen also uh, has multiple outlets that you can place on different uh, bigger screens or combined with other screens as we'll see in our example. So the processor usually really uh, something that you need to keep uh, uh, an eye on. And uh, it's very easy to operate by pressing the button and then getting to activate the, the ultrasound. Also has a lock button that allow you to disconnect the needle when we are processing the, uh, uh, the, the needle sample. Uh, that processor uh, connector here is just a click and you can click it back and go back to the next sample right away. And this is the example of the lock that when we are uh, pressing it, and this is how the sample performed. You will have the probe in a proper position and the needle coming parallel to it in that 20 
degree, 15 to 20 degree angle. So now back to the uh, cases, which is the most important to know from this, how we can implement this. As you see here, um, this is a patient that has a right upper lobe lung nodule that more um, having a bronchus sign. The pink bronchus sign that you see there is an extended airway that we created during planning. It might not be existing, but if you look at different angles, you can see there's either two airways, one of them going inferiorly to the lesion and one of them going superiorly to the lesion. We create, we create those extended path uh, when we are trying to do the planning assuming that if we can have it, we can look at the lesion and get a better eccentric, a concentric view on it. Again, you can see the relation between the nodule and the airways that neighboring it, that's from the ion plan. This is the 3D, as I mentioned earlier, has multiple airways. The pink one that I, we extended to make sure that if we can have a branching then we can turn toward it, but the real airways are the gray ones that goes either superiorly here in this example or inferiorly to the nodule. Here you can see the borders of the pleura where the, uh, uh, the anatomy mark uh, uh, borders. And uh, from that, uh, we proceed with the biopsy. Of course, we pick one airway when we do that. And this is uh, an example of the radial signal that we got. And we are not surprised when we saw this because uh, we went through one of the airways, even, even on the planning here of the EBUS, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the robotic planning. You can see that the airway telling you that the lesion is uh, not superior to the airway. And that's what we see, superior to the airway, even with the augmented fluoroscopy. Uh, implementing now the uh, the uh, inod ultrasound image, I put that example here to show you the difference or the uh, the matching signal that you see in two different um, uh, techniques or different uh, machines. This is the baseline radio uh, image that we got earlier, and this is the inod, and both of them confirming that we have the uh, eccentric view of the nodule. Of course, you have the option always to advance, uh, to zoom in uh, by touch screen on the same example to get that uh, lesion bigger if you want. You can adjust the gain like any ultrasound of or both uh, uh, this. And um, here, an example of when we saw the lesion, uh, we have, uh, uh, with the ultrasound, we proceeded with the needle TBNA. As I mentioned earlier, you have this hypoechoic triangle with the marker and the needle going exactly contra 180 degrees away from that marker. Of course, as you see, there's a changes on the size of the nodule where we are biopsying. And I'm gonna move to the next slide to show you a closer picture of that, because when you are you moving the needle in and out, you will have some motion action that moving the probe with it also. And uh, the goal is to maintain that view. So really it doesn't need that aggressive move more than stability of the depth of the, uh, the needle. So really it's a two, uh, sometimes you need either, if you don't have the rope, you have the scope, you have somebody holding the scope, and the other person operating the needle. Because you have to maintain the depth of the needle by holding it at the inlet of the scope and the needle operating with the other hand. Um, I'm privileged to use the robot with it. That's why I can just adjust it with two hands, but still I'm using two hands to get that. And I'll show you that an example on the picture later. Now here, this video is showing you the relation that you are out of the scope. Um, of course, if I have other modality of bronchoscopy, uh, robotic bronchoscopy, or thin ultra thin, I will have vision seeing the needle and the, 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 the probe coming out. But when you are outside that far in the lung, 
sometimes you don't have the vision because you are passing that out and you depend on the fluoroscopy to see the needle and the, the scope, uh, both uh, the, the, uh, the, the probe and the needle out. In this example, you see the needle moving in and out and the probe is out and we are biopsying, as you mentioned earlier with the other live TBNA. So this is how it looks like uh, uh, when we are doing it. Uh, 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 if you don't have a person carrying the, uh, the, the, you don't need somebody to carry the uh, uh, ultrasound processor, you can mount it as I mentioned because you have a good length from the needle to the uh, processor. But um, as you see here, the robot is mounted already so I can use both hands to stabilize the needle in the location and then biopsy with the other one. You can see here again this angle how we are looking and then adjusting the needle with the uh, biopsy. Uh, this is as I mentioned the two hands and really is like a statue of liberty because you need the more less kink on the needle you can then rotate and adjust your uh, indicator for the location because sometimes either you rotate the needle itself or you need to rotate the whole unit together to get that indicator on the side that you want to biopsy. Especially in the cases where you are uh, having a blood vessel that you try to avoid to biopsy with the PBD. This is uh, the sample that we get out. We learned from using 25 gauge needle that having a, uh, even without removing the stylet, uh, only halfway, uh, you can get this amount of sample. Uh, in the beginning, uh, in our first cases, we thought that if we put a high suction, will be more bare material. So we put full suction, meaning minus 20 uh, cc on that minus uh, suction, uh, suction uh, 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 syringe. But the needle get clogged, and then we have trouble pushing the style back. So uh, really, you don't need that much negative pressure. Maximum you can use minus five uh, on the suction, or even this sample done even without using any of the style it removed. We did also the only partial removal of the style, and we got the sample out. This is how the needle looks like uh, coming out and the probe uh, with that angle that I mentioned earlier. And here you can see the unit together uh, 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 as you see there. So uh, with that, I would like to bring that up back. Okay, we do we need all these technologies to bars. Uh, the more combined technologies we have now, absolutely giving us the privilege to get to nodules that never been biopsy before. With more safety, of course, uh, than the uh, trans the uh, uh, CT guided biopsies. With more uh, advantage for the patient getting the diagnosis and the staging at the same time by performing EBUS. Uh, but also, we have to go to our to the basics and being smart about selecting the right cases for this. We should not, we should not go uh, wild about using anything, anytime, uh, all the time, because every case can count differently. Also, we have to consider the cost uh, of the equipment we're using, but what we put on the other side is the cost of repeating biopsy for the patient by time and cost of the same procedure. So all this equipment are very expensive, but if we are smart about picking the right equipment for the biopsy, I think we will be getting better ma management for the patients, but also with less uh, cost because we're preventing multiple biopsies. Um, radial EBOS, always is a very important tool that we use in our practice. Uh, when we, uh, even when we use the cone beam and the fluoroscopy augmented, because especially as you mentioned earlier, with the use of cryobiopsies, we are 
a confirming always how much are we in relation with any other blood vessel before we do the trial biopsy, for example. But with this technology, having those cases when we have a difficult relationship between the airway and we are getting a centric view, not getting the tool inside it, uh, we had to repeat biopsy for a patient after we got this uh, for two patients that just to get the diagnosis. And the INOD helped us get the diagnosis for them. With that, I would like uh, to stop here. If you have any uh, questions, please, I'll stop sharing soon. And please feel free to have any questions for me. Thanks, Avi, for that uh, wonderful presentation. And um, I think I know it's too early to discuss on the diagnostic yield and uh, because it's, it's, it's a very new technology. But I think we have some... Um, interesting questions uh, especially pertaining to our region so you have shown us um, the biopsy using um, a robotic bronchoscopy and um, using cone beam but what do you think like what is the place of inod when you um, like um, in the centers where they have a cone beam because it also is a real time imaging so you can have a tool in lesion confirmation with that so uh, do you right. still think, uh, we need to do uh, in centers where we have a cone beam, or I think it's more uh, reasonable to do these cases when we don't have a cone beam or um, robotic bronchoscopy. And, and um, continuing to that, uh, if we have uh, only a bronchoscopic uh, technique available in the hospital, like what is the choice of bronchoscopy? Like uh, what is the uh, ODID? And uh, is it possible to push these probes through um, the small scopes, which is 3 mm and uh, 1.7 um, inner diameter, so ultra thin uh, scopes. Uh, will this will the needle be go through that? Yeah. So so the working channel that we use for the uh, robot, let's, let's say start with this two point oh, so it fits smoothly in it, no issues at all. And the needle is I think one point seven, just uh, I as I remember. The second thing, um, uh, your question, I I put those examples here combining them together just to show you how does it look like and to show you the relationship in, in those cases, not because you have to use a cone beam with it, but it's easier if I put for you only ultrasound images today, you will see the needle, you see the uh, hyperechoic area uh, that indicating where the needle is, but then you don't know where am I for the lesion. So just I put it, uh, I was, it was a learning curve for us. So I did it uh, with the first cases just to make sure that if I don't get it with that way, I get it with the other one, especially for the patient that I'm repeating the biopsy for. But uh, for sure, we have days that we don't have convene when we do cases. So if I am doing the case and I have a radial image with a fluoro showing me I am eccentric, fluoro will not tell me where the lesion is, but would say, tell me if the two, if I am out of the scope, I am seeing where the radial is, so I can mark the the the, the uh, uh, screen where the lesion is, at least with the tape, and then we push that out and do the, the TBNA with I not, for example. So uh, using it with a scope is that what actually invented for? Not, it was not started for the robotic. It was not started for cone beam. It start as a increasing the yield for the biopsy because we never have a live needle biopsy with radial epochs. We have to take the radial and put the needle. We have to take the radial and put the fourth biopsy. This is the only tool that allow us to see a live lesion uh, tool in the uh, ultrasound image. And the second question is like, um, you see the grayscale image. Uh, I can see that this is a new ultrasound probe. Uh, so the grayscale image, suddenly when you have a shift from uh, one system to the other system, because we uh, read the radial EBUS images, especially uh, in small ground glass opacities, this uh, radial, the grayscale looks a little more contrast compared to the currently available radial EBUS systems. So uh, how, how do you work on with uh, a small GGO? Because GGO doesn't produce a big concentric or an eccentric image. So they have these uh, small um, clues on the radial probe. And uh, with this high contrast, uh, do you have any experience on the GGOs, like uh, small small lesions that are less than uh, 10 millimeters and uh, how the signal is? Is it um, suddenly when you shift from one uh, grayscale to the other grayscale, 
there, there is definitely um, a lack of understanding like what the signal is uh, showing to us between the normal lung parenchyma and the GGO and the uh, atelectasis. So uh, what is your experience uh, maybe with your uh, one of few cases? Yeah, so uh, uh, unfortunately when I have a case that shows GGO, always uh, I consider it as a, a condom case because you can, uh, uh, I can't gamble because some GGO, I don't know why they have some kind of solid component and some of them is only pure GGO. The one with a solid component, even with this, I could not get a good uh, signal on. It's not because uh, it's failing with the contrast, but because this is the nature of the niche. Uh, it's not hyper echoic enough uh, or hyper echoic enough to give the contrast between the lung tissue and the uh, GGO. And uh, those ones are actually, I even even putting the radial out, I just for to see if we are there, you don't see, get any signal, but we spin again and you see that you are uh, inside the region or you get, uh, and you get diagnosis too. So uh, uh, unfortunately, this is a not good tool for GGO, but great for even smaller lesion uh, with uh, like, let's say 10 millimeter with a centric. Uh, you can get a great signal. Yeah, traditionally, uh, we uh, know from our previous textbooks and the literature that radialibus is not a great tool for uh, lesions that are in the medial one-third uh, because of right. the, the vessels. I think this will have uh, a major uh, role in uh, those lesions which are very close to the vasculature. That's what I understood from your uh, uh, presentation. So Two, two things. Two things you do for that matter. Uh, one is that this coming already with implanted uh, normal cell and flush that I mentioned. When you flush it, that gives you that change in the contour from not having good image and filling that airway with that signal. The second thing, uh, Dr. Tim Murgo uh, started the first case here in the United States. So he mentioned that suctioning against those airways and create edema, uh, almost like swelling of it, and putting them the eye nod prop out, getting you better also uh, uh, contact between the probe and the airway and give you better signal. Uh, that's particularly for the inner third part when, when the airways, we know that is larger than the diameter of that probe. And one more question is the control unit looks like it has got a uh, separate uh, channel for needle and the radial ebus comes uh, below that like the how we have the convex ebus. It, it is, are, are both these uh, a single use or um, only the needle you have to replace every time when you do a procedure? Uh, unfortunately, the whole thing is one time use, the probe and the, and the needle because the needle is not is one connected one piece. Even you can't take it out of that uh, sheath. So they come with combined sheath as a, as you saw earlier, and the needle come out on that twenty degree angle usually. Uh, we can adjust. Sometimes we push the needle a little bit out to make it fang out a little bit if we need it to go out. So we start doing some kind of tweaks around the system uh, to see if we can get. Uh, sometimes a needle uh, signal therapy. And uh, the question is, is it possible to pass any other instrument other than needle through the working channel of that um, device like one? I wish. Uh, or... I wish we can take the needle out and push like a tiny forceps. I think it can be something in the future because we know we want the cryopopsy. We want uh, even at least as many uh, forceps to go in there. I hope um, Boston Scientific can think about creating a working channel instead of a needle only come out with it. I think um, stand up questions. I think we, we had a very great uh, discussion and uh, thanks AB once again for uh, coming uh, on a very special day. I think it's a festival season there. Uh, so we uh, continue to do our uh, Academy of Bronchoscopy webinars every month, uh, usually on a Sunday in the evening. And uh, we will be uh, talking on a new topic next month in January, probably on the new imaging 
technology is coming up in bronchoscopy and we will soon uh, send the information who is the speaker. Maybe once again, uh, from the Academy of Bronchoscopy and Desha, the hospitals, uh, we are very thankful to you for uh, giving uh, insights on uh, iNOT. I hope we have this um, technology soon in our hospital as well. Uh, let's see, and we are uh, hoping to have more information next year uh, with your experience and some data on what is the diagnostic yield and what is its exact place uh, in pitiful pulmonary nodule diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Happy New Year. <laughs>